I'd like to introduce myself briefly. I'm a geriatrician, um, but my life was transformed six years ago. I'm an IHI fellow. I spent a year at the IHI and learned about so much of what Don shared in the plenary this morning. And for the last five, five and a half years, I've been back in Sheffield in Yorkshire in the UK, trying to translate some of that knowledge into um, our healthcare system in the city. So, I'm going to cut to the punchline first, and it's this line. It's a line I heard from a good friend from MIT, Steve Spear. He talks about um, greatness in organizations being discovered, not decided. And I think I heard that from Don this morning. He talked about a group of workers who actually wanted to discover how to remove red beads from a box, but weren't allowed to. And actually, it's those red beads that impede patient flow, whether it's a non-elective emergency pathway, medical or surgical, or whether it's an elective um, surgical pathway or long-term condition management. It's those red beads in the box that block the patient flow. So my presentation today is really about how we enable staff to discover ways to take those red beads out of the box. So in this session, I'm going to just share a little bit of the flow basics, um, the language we use when we're talking about patient flow, then share a real life case study um, from the last four years or so as to how we've applied these principles into a real healthcare setting. And then a little bit on how we improve flow, the theory behind it, and then what we're doing to try and spread and develop this capability at scale in the UK. Big thank you to the Health Foundation. Um, from my IHI fellowship onwards through the Cost Quality Flow Programme, um, they've been a true supporter um, and friend on the journey that I and my organisation have been on. This is a picture of the report. Um, I've got a large pile of copies of this report at the front. If anybody would like a copy of the report, it holds a lot of what I'm going to be presenting. Um, please feel free to come and collect one at the end. So, how do we measure a, the dynamics of a system? Well, the word flow naturally leads to water for me. So, when I'm teaching about flow, I like to use analogy. And the analogy I use a lot of the time is talking about a bathtub. The demand of a system is like the tap flowing in, whether that's the patients being referred for an elective surgical operation or the emergency medical patients turning up in an A&E department. That's the tap that's filling the system, that's the demand. The supply, the drain out, the plug hole in the drain, that's what the patient's presenting, the supply needs. So if that's an elective surgical operation, then the supply is that operation in the operating theatre. Um, for an emergency medical patient, it's the acute care and discharge is the supply. Work in progress, the water in the bathtub. In an elective surgical um, procedure, that would be the waiting list. The patient's waiting for that elective surgical procedure. In a non-elective um, inpatient um, pathway, then that's the patients in the hospital at the time. So it's the number of medical patients um, uh, in that care pathway at midnight, for instance. And we'll be sharing that sort of data in the case study. Cycle time, as Don said this morning, uh, our systems are dramatically complex and each of the processes within that system has its own cycle time. Whether that's the time for the patient in an operating theatre, the time going through a scanner or such like, our complex systems tend to have many different cycle times within them. And then the lead time. The lead time is from when the request is made of a service until the service is delivered. So from the patient presenting with, with the, the need for an operation to the operation being done. From the emergency medical patient to first contacting the healthcare system through to the time when they're discharged from the system. This is the language of flow. Demand, supply, work in progress, cycle times and lead times. But I'm a doctor, so I actually, through my career, have been dealing with many complex systems, the patients in front of me who have things flowing through them. So when we're teaching flow, uh, especially to clinicians, we try to use the same analogy. What do we do if we want to improve um, a, a patient and, and, and their healthcare? Well, we assess them to begin with, and it's the same with improving flow. We enable staff to understand their system, to assess it and come to a diagnosis and release the ideas that they have. That we find rarely a problem with healthcare staff. So often our, our staff are brimming over with ideas. It's having that opportunity, the capacity and the capability to release those ideas. 
and then move on to treatment. Those PDSA cycles that Don was talking about this morning, that learning, discovering how to take those red beads out of the box. And finally, when we've learned better ways of, of designing the system, spread it and standardize it, make it the usual way of working. So just like a patient, assessing, diagnosing, treating, and then trying to keep the patient stable, it's the same approach with the complex healthcare system. So before I go into more of the theory, I'd like to show a real case study um, where we've applied these principles. And as a geriatrician, um, I'd like to talk about older people's care in my home city of Sheffield. So Sheffield is the UK's fifth biggest city, population of 580,000. Um, we're quite a simple healthcare system in that we have a single adult provider that's vertically integrated, so hospital and community staff are all part of one organisation. We're large, we cover a population size of 580,000 with a turnover of the organisation of approaching a billion pounds per year and 16,000 staff. So we're a big box of beads and um, within that box of beads there are many care pathways um, which uh, flow all the time. So when we're starting to assess our systems, the, the first part of the diagnostic, um, we start to tell stories and lots and lots of patient stories. Held within those patient stories, both success and failure, we look at understanding where flow has been achieved and what are the characteristics of that. How do we test to make that the usual way of working? And when we look for patient stories where things haven't gone as well as we'd like to, capture the learning from that. But of course, we then want to mix that with the technical, the data, to get a true picture. And so we process mapped. We process mapped older people's care and realized, goodness me, it's a really complex system. So we got to the point of understanding in our assessment phase of not only every step of older people's care through our hospital, through geriatric care, back to their own homes, but how long patients were staying each of those process steps and how many patients there were at any one time. We started with a deep assessment to understanding our system before we set out on trying to change anything. We really wanted to understand our box of beads. How many red, how many blue, what were the characteristics of that? Not only numerically, but qualitatively from the patient experience perspective with stories. And then we needed a methodology. W. Edward Stemming would quite often ask, and what's the method? Well, we wanted a method that was validated. So we looked to an organization that's very good at redesigning complex systems. And that's Toyota. In 2001, Toyota developed a methodology that they simply called Ubeya. Ubeya translates, I apologize to anybody who speaks Japanese in the room, um, it translates roughly to big room or war room. Um, it's a room in which in 2001, they invited a, a group of key stakeholders to bring their knowledge of previous car design to work together to prototype, do PDSA cycles, share data. And with a relatively short lead time, they tested, designed and launched the 2003 Corolla. At that time, the most successful car on the planet. By the staff meeting together in that big room, um, their PDSA cycles, the sharing of data together allowed them to overcome the complexity. And here it is in, in, in theory. So seeing together, learning together, acting together in this room. Now, we'd already seen our process map of geriatric care and we saw similarities between the complexity of our healthcare system for older people and a motor car but we knew we couldn't walk into a group of clinicians and talk about the car industry, so we translated everything. We removed all the Japanese language. Um, we set up a room and we had no mention of motor cars in it, but we did everything else exactly the same. We invited in who we believed to be the key stakeholders. No mandate, it was a true invitation. You only came if you wanted to come to learn about the system and then be enabled to try and take some of the red beads out of that system. And so nurses, doctors, therapists, administration clerks, GPs, social workers, community health staff, and patients um, started to come to a meeting that we held once a week. And it was, a, a, um, although the other side of this big room, this Ubeya, is totally data filled, it looks very technical. Actually, it's a human meeting place where um, cultures and behaviors are challenged and PDSA cycles are discussed and we start every meeting with a patient story to remind us why we're there. It's not a project, we've never used that P word in this type of meeting, um, it's continuous improvement. And myself and a colleague co-coach this room every Monday lunchtime, and we've been doing so for over four years now. 
I'd like to share some now of what's been happening in that room. First of all, we did the assessment. We looked at those patient stories, looked at data, understood the demand, the supply, the work in progress. How many patients were in our hospital at any one time? What were the characteristics of the delay to flow in those patient care pathways? Identifying what were the blue beads and what were the red beads in that system? And then in the room, there were frontline staff and leadership. And I saw leadership that was truly enabling, leaders that gave frontline staff the permission to test ways to remove the red beads. And they started to undertake PDSA cycles. Tens and tens and tens of PDSA cycles, all measured and all then discussed at the next weekly meeting. So gradual learning. I'm not going to share all the failed PDSA cycles because in a failed PDSA cycle, it's a huge learning opportunity, but you learn what not to do. So we don't do those things now. But along the way, we've learned from both success and failure dramatically. We learned in the assessment initially that our two key flow impairments were in the first 24 hours of care, wanting to get the right decisions made at the right level of seniority for patients entering the healthcare system as medical emergencies, uh, the frail older people. But then we had a second phase of, of impaired flow that we identified, which was when acute care had been completed, that assessment to be able to then support somebody back in their own home. We tackled the initial one first. We started PDSA cycles of enabling doctors, nurses, therapists to work differently. Instead of batching patients, having those bars filling up, being able to see patients as they were coming in and measure. And we saw, this is data from PDSA cycles. So we saw the time from arrival at the hospital to the completion of multidisciplinary assessment dropping from 20 hours on average to under six hours on average. Staff gained confidence. They were learning what a box with less red beads in it looked like. And they were able to then move to implementation. They got to such a level of confidence in the testing that they had the confidence that it should be done in one place. The demand aspect of the assessment identified there was enough patient demand to drive a specialist unit to do this. And they started to, like in a, in, a, in a car design, where they'd have a clay or computer-aided design prototype which would gradually be modified, um, we used cartoons. We put the learning from the PDSA cycles in and, and gradually developed this concept of a unit with doctors, nurses, and therapists undertaking specialist geriatric uh, assessment in as close to real time as possible. We struggled a lot with what to call it, but it opened and was called a frailty unit. Um, and this is now the data. We changed something. So to differentiate between change and improvement, we need to measure. So I'm now going to show you a set of the measurement to understand what the box now looks like with the ideas the staff had tested uh, um, implemented. So on all these graphs, these are the Schuhart statistical process control charts that Don was talking about this morning. On all the charts, the x-axis represents time, and the y-axis, the vertical, represents the thing we're measuring. So opening a frailty unit, the aim was to try and get that initial assessment and acute care started in a timely manner to reduce the delay downstream. And we saw 34% of patients actually be able to have the value they needed from the hospital added within one day of being in the hospital, and then be able to get back home again. Every time these charts are split, like this one is here, then that's statistically significant um, by, the, by the Schuhart criteria. So statistically significant change in the proportion of patients who we were able to add the value to and get them home within one day. Downstream, what that meant was a reduction in length of stay by four days in the geriatric medicine department. And that's a dramatic efficiency. So this is no um, rationing. This is no removal of value to the patient. This is taking away the waste out of the system. And in my healthcare system, one day in a hospital geriatric medicine bed costs our system about 300 pounds. The support as an average of what our frail older people need to be supported in their own home costs about 75 pounds. So it's a fourfold difference being in hospital compared to being supported in your own home. So this starts to become dramatic efficiency savings. We measured mortality. This is raw mortality as a balanced measure. We were measuring it to make sure we didn't harm the system, to make sure the mortality didn't go up. 
but we saw actually a drop in raw mortality. This is a combination of two things. It's more timely, specialist, appropriate care in the hospital setting, but it's also being able to add the value the hospital um, needs to and allow somebody to go for their natural end of life process back in their own home in a controlled and supported way. It became safer care in our hospital. Staff then became frustrated. We knew at the beginning of the process design that there were two key delays to flow in our system. We now had a confidence that we were getting it right in that first 24 hours with the frailty unit, but we still had the delay at the other end. When patients had had their acute care completed, especially after a severe acute illness requiring stay in hospital on the geriatric medicine base wards, we could see that it was taking time to then assess the patients to get them back home again. And in one of the big room meetings, um, I believe it was the patient who was in the room that day challenged us. The patient's challenge, why do you assess older people in hospital kitchens, hospital beds, hospital um, baths to decide what they need when they get back home again? And so the challenge was, could we flip that over? Instead of assessing patients to understand their needs and wait for those support needs to be met in the home, could we flip it over, instead of assessing the discharge, actually discharge to assess the patient? Could we redesign our box of beads so that the patients could be transferred home and assessed in their own home environment, and then those needs met in real time? Lots of PDSA cycles ensued. Starting at the single patient level, one therapist being able to take one patient home on one day with clinical and managerial support to be able to uh, um, do that in not the usual way all the air cover and, and, and support needed to make sure it's completely safe. And we learned from that one patient. It worked. Community colleagues were able to put in place what was needed and that led to more tests and more tests and more tests until the staff had redesigned fundamentally the discharge process. So now in Sheffield, patients on, when frail older patients, when they complete acute care, we can now transfer them home on the same day, back to their own home. They are met by our community staff and assessed in real time within two hours of getting home. And on the same day, the needs of equipment, home care and ongoing rehabilitation are then met in real time starting the day they get home. We can now discharge to assess them rather than assessing to discharge them. What did that look like in numbers? Well, Discharge to Assess, this is the first pilot ward that um, stepped up to the plate and volunteered to, to be the ward to help design this. First of all, they measured what assessing to discharge looked like, and it was taking 6.7 days on average, the data showed. This control chart is a measurement, the x-axis is consecutive patients, the y-axis is time from completion of acute hospital care to the time the patient's actually back in their own home. 6.7 days um, prior to the redesign. They then implemented the new box of beads that they designed themselves. They had discovered how to do this, our own staff in the big room through PDSA cycles. And 6.7 days became 0.4 days as the patient was simply flipped over in the process. They were taken home and assessed in their own home and their needs met. There was more to it than that. We found that actually the assessment in the patient's own home was far more meaningful. How you function in your own kitchen, your own bathroom, your own bedroom, in a case mix of frail older patients who have a 30 to 40% chance of having a dementia process is dramatically different in the patient's own home than done in the hospital setting. Did this sustain? Well, here's a year's worth of that ward's data and it influenced the whole of that ward's discharge process. A, a proportion of the patients from this ward actually go into 24-hour care care homes or into um, a skilled nursing facilities, intermediate care beds. But the, for the whole system data, this ward saw a 30% reduction in length of stay. But again, it was all removal of waste, that time waiting on the wards when acute hospital care was complete. Waste that now we could define because we're doing it better in the patient's home, that assessment. Safety data again, this was unexpected. I work in a hospital now where a senior nurse sent me this data. I find that a huge privilege. Um, and this is data from that ward that saw the reduction in length of stay, flipping over the concept of how discharged, uh, discharging patients. At the same point in time, so there's time linked to causality, we saw a 30% reduction in inpatient fall rate on that ward. There was no change in the denominator. There was the same number of patients on the ward and there was no change in the case mix. 
the only interpretation that we can come to with this is actually now we've taken out of this ward the patients who had completed acute hospital care who were far more likely to be mobile, who were well, as it were. I'd, I mean, I, 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 I hesitate to use the word fit because when we talk about frail older people going home, um, we're going home to continue their care. The interpretation that appears to be that those patients who have completed acute hospital care are more likely to be falling over, more likely to be immobile, perhaps a little bit um, agitated that they want to get back home to their loved ones, to where they want to be. That was one ward, that was a ward which set off on the pilots. This is now whole system data. This has spread through our hospital system so that in the last year, 9,000 patients have actually been transferred over the hospital community interface to the service which we call Active Recovery. Active Recovery in the community is a health and social care collaborative service that assesses patients as they get home and puts in place what they need in real time there and then. Three, four years ago, it was taking us 5.5 days in our whole system. So this includes surgical wards and medical wards. This is older people transferring over that interface. 5.5 days was the time it was taking us from a completion of acute hospital care to getting home. In this phase, we were testing, learning, pilot wards stepping up to the plate, and we started to see that, that knowledge and, and uh, habits start to change across the system. And at this point, um, there was a resource shift. We had such a confidence in our city that the commissioners of our health and social care system had the confidence to move resource into the community to be able to form the active recovery service at a capacity to get to real time for the whole system. So at this point, we're now down to an average waiting time of 1.1 days from completion of acute hospital care to the patient being back home fully supported in their own home. Three, four years ago, that was taking 5.5 days. In the last 12 months, this is an interface for 9,000 patients. So 9,000 patients are crossing that interface four days quicker. You only have to start to do the maths um, roughly to work out that this is actually a multi-million pound saving in, in resource. There's no rationing here. This is all waste removal. This is achieving for our patients what they want to see in the room. That is for the health and social care staff of my city who have discovered how to do this. That's not for me. I'd like to point out one little bit here. This is last winter. You'll see that little rise in the time series data. Last year in the UK, um, the influenza vaccine was less, less effective than it has been in previous years. Um, we got a, a real uh, um, increase in the tap was flowing very strongly for older people because the influenza A vaccine um, barely worked at all and we had large numbers presenting um, to, uh, to our hospital systems across the UK. Not only was the flow of older people's care so much better in our system, but it was far more resilient. We were able to deal with that change in demand in a fundamentally better way. What terrifies me is the thought of that happening when actually our box of beads looked like this before. Um, we'd have been in real trouble, but with the system the way it was, we survived, we maintained quality and flow. Whole system-wise, it's having influence. So many presentations I go to, I, I hear about um, uh, um, demographic tsunamis, the older people and being the, the challenge. Actually, um, life expectancy is increasing. It's something we should celebrate. Um, but it is a challenge for our healthcare systems, the long-term conditions, the complexity of these patients. But in Sheffield's healthcare system, we're, able, we're enabling staff to redesign, to take those red beads out. So actually, it's bucking the trend. We're seeing for non-elective admissions to our hospital system in, in, in Sheffield, actually a decrease in length of stay of older people. And 65% of our beds are occupied by people aged over 65. So this is dramatic scale um, change. So that's real. That is the principles of how to enable staff to discover better patient flow. Don talked this morning about this, the combination of subject matter with improvement science, the two coming together actually being the place where improvement happens. 
we've learned that actually um, coaches, people with a skill set in coaching human change and some improvement science um, can be dramatic enablers of this. That's what actually happens in our big room where we bring this together. In our Ubeya, in our big rooms, we see two coaches with that skill set, coaching skills plus improvement science skills, coaching a set of staff ranging from, we've had chief executives at times to hierarchically, traditionally some of our most uh, lower level members of staff, ward cleaners and such like. Everybody has an equal voice in our big rooms, in our Ubeyas. And the coaches coach them to discover through PDSA cycles better ways to work. But it takes rigor and a methodology. This is the roadmap that our coaches follow. They first of all do that diagnostic. They help, they do something which we call the five V's. They help a group of staff understand the value of their care pathway. They teach them social movement skills, patient storytelling and such like to engage and involve others at scale. They make things visual, process mapping. So often staff only know about their one part of the care pathway. By process mapping, sharing, putting this up in big rooms together, everybody has much more feel for what's going on. Numbers are important. So evidence, we encourage staff to pull numbers, put the numbers up on the walls in their big room as well. And then value stream map. Actually understand what a future box of beads could look like that has true value in it. And with those five Vs done, we then do post-it note frenzies with staff. Post-it notes, I think, are one of the most powerful tools in healthcare improvement, and it gives everybody in the room a voice. If, like me, you're very shy, then you don't like speaking up in, in, in an improvement meeting, but with a post-it note, it's much easier to write something down. So the coaches help staff to turn their ideas, their thoughts, into uh, um, uh, uh, written words when they go onto our big room walls and truly represent our staff. Having done that, the staff own the work with their patients in the room, they set a global aim, then they use some of the tools for improvement. They form a driver diagram of where they want to be and then start to undertake PDSA cycles. Tests of change to try to close that gap from the current box of beads to future box of beads with re lead re less red in, in it. We've had two big rooms in Sheffield so far that have reached full success. In geriatric medicine, hospital community care, which I've been sharing, but also there's another Ubeya in respiratory medicine. It's been meeting for three years and has dramatically reduced length of stay and mortality. It, it's humbling looking at what they're doing and they've reached such levels of standardization that everybody in their whole directorate knows exactly how everything works, wherever they are, because they've designed it themselves, the autonomy and ownership that is achieved in a, in a big room is, 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 is so powerful. Along the bottom, there is what I think has been missing a lot of the time. Um, Top-down change is largely uh, um, uh, um, resisted by, by clinical staff. But this methodology gives staff the ownership themselves. So these coached weekly meetings with autonomy, the use of patient story and data together and reflective learning. The, the S of PDSA cycles is so often the most challenging part, but in our weekly improvement meetings in the big rooms, the S is real. Staff actually meet and discuss it um, and, and move forward gradually. So in Sheffield, we now have eight of these uh, um, Ubeas, these big rooms, and we've translated this learning into a new course. It's dramatically about human change, behaviors and habits. Boy, is the 20% technical important, but as Margie Godfrey, our great friend from Dartmouth, reminds us, actually successful improvement, delivering a service which is a human right, is actually a human change process. And although these Ubeas, these big rooms look technical, actually the magic of them, the essence is the human interaction that goes on inside them. Toyota know that. Toyota know it's the interaction of their staff that leads them to be able to deliver great products. So with the Health Foundation, um, they, they're supporting us still. Um, we're forever grateful to them. We've turned this knowledge into a course, a one year action learning course, and it's called Improving Flow. It focuses around team coaching. It's one year action learning. We're halfway through training cohort one. So 12 care pathways defined by a condition. Six of them are in Sheffield, three in Warwick and three in Bath across England. 
those 12 care pathways are being coached by pairs of coaches, one an enga emotionally engaged clinician from the care pathway, the other, I'll use the term manager loosely, somebody who um, is from elsewhere in the organisation, doesn't have operational responsibility and brings in that independence, that ability to ask the naive question, the fresh eyes of not being normalised to the system and those two co-coaches working together. So for instance, in the geriatric medicine um, big room that the case study comes from, I'm the emotionally engaged clinician and I co-coach with a manager who is not part of the geriatric medicine um, department. It's really powerful for many reasons. The clinician and the manager together, not only in the work, but enabling the staff to, to have this opportunity to discover new ways to work. And simple practicalities, because this isn't a project, because it's continuous improvement, having two people gives a resilience. So for the last four years, we've never failed to have a coach in the room coaching the staff to move forward. And the Health Foundation have commissioned RAND Europe to evaluate. Um, I can see in the corner of my eye a member of the RAND team in the room with us today. So, what a privilege. Not only are we learning ourselves internally, but we're going to have external evaluation to maximise the learning of what we're trying to achieve. The 12 care pathways, the principles of patient flow, removing red beads from boxes, are generic. Um, they, they are, are the first set of 12 care pathways cover both elective and non-elective, medical and surgical. The important thing is they're defined by the condition the condition that the patient flows through, that set of microsystems of care. And that's what defines the staff who meet in the big rooms. And so there's now 14 big rooms that I'm aware of in, in, in English hospitals, eight of them in Sheffield, three in Warwick and three in Bath, with staff meeting and being enabled to improve patient flow. We want to scale this. Um, we're planning to attempt to use a social franchise model. We're not going to um, put this at national level and try to sprinkle it down. We want this to spread, maintain the fidelity horizontally. So in cohort one, we're running it in Sheffield at the moment. We're halfway through, already green shoots have changed. We're having amazingly strong feedback. In October of this year, the three hospitals that are involved in this training program, this action learning in Sheffield, will be running the course in their own centres. So in October, there'll be three improving flow programmes, Sheffield, Warwick and Bath, each with our aim is 12 care pathways learning together. 72 coaches being trained across 36 pathways next year. And the International Centre for Social Franchise, we've already been talking with them, learning from them about how to package this so that um, we're, we're all familiar with the concept of franchising, um, you know, Starbucks and, and such like, but social franchising is similar. It's a way of maintaining fidelity, quality, but the social element means there's no profit in this. We want this material to be free to the franchisee to deliver so that we maximise spread within, within healthcare systems. So next year, th starting this October, three centres delivering and uh, other partners are coming on board. We're already very far on in discussion with other organisations that want to be involved in these three centres to then be centres in cohort three starting in October 2017. And hopefully that um, translates to how this can gradually multiply. Will it work? Well, like Don says this morning, we're going to learn from failure along the way, I'm sure. But we have some um, learning already in, in, in our franchise box. We have two successful Ubayers that are already meeting for three and four years respectively that have led to dramatic improvements in patient flow, efficiency and safety. Often I'll stand at this sort of presentation and talk about how this is all about the patients, but actually it's not. It's also about the staff because what we see is um, the staff who have this opportunity to come to big rooms to discover through PDSA cycle testings, um, they become really engaged, the staff satisfaction improves, um, it's um, really proud members of staff who leave when they know that they've been involved in, in designing new ways to work, delivering better patient flow. So in summary, Improving patient flow, um, 
without question leads to better patient experience. We measure this at scale. So in the case study in Chartered Medicines uh, um, patient um, uh, flow, all the patients um, have the opportunity to fill in uh, a questionnaire to feed back to us about their experience of the discharge to assess to active recovery process. Many of them are interviewed and the team reflect on that information all the time to try to continue to improve. When I sit with geriatric patients and talk to them about what they want, actually flow is one of the key issues. So often I'll hear the answer back, I want to be back home please, I want to be with my loved ones. And it's um, humbling to be able to work with staff to help us achieve that. In this work, we rarely ever set out to lower cost. Um, this is work that is owned by frontline staff. Frontline staff set their own themes, their own aims, and almost invariably that um, is around patient experience. When staff are able to assess, diagnose, and treat their own system, their treatment is to improve patient experience. What we're seeing at scale now is when that opportunity is, is, is implemented, um, the, the cost, the efficiency, and the safety drop out as byproducts. On, on one level, of course it does. What patient wants an unsafe healthcare system in their experience? What patient wants us to waste anything in their experience? But actually, the box of beads to our healthcare staff actually is a patient experience. And when we use that language, maintain the patient storytelling, actually we find that the efficiency and the safety drop out. I don't have a counterfactual in this work, but I believe that if we actually um, dictated to the coaches that they had to set out on a journey to tell the staff to improve efficiency, to lower cost, to improve safety, I don't believe we'd get the same traction with frontline staff. I believe that actually by starting with the patient experience, by enabling the PDSA cycle to improve experience, these other metrics of safety and efficiency are achieved um, far more dramatically. As Don said this morning, um, our, our systems aren't just like a box of beads. They're like many boxes of beads with many colors in. They're dramatically complex. Over the last 40 years, the complexity of the technology in our systems has, has escalated so dramatically. We can't decide how to make that better. Steve Spears' words, we need to discover, not decide how to improve and get to greatness. And that requires um, this iterative prototyping. Um, the car industry understand that. Between each car model launches thousands of these prototype steps. In our geriatric medicine big room over the last four years, there have been hundreds of those prototyping steps that we've been learning. And it's that with the human interaction that's allowed us to overcome the complexity. Six years ago, before I had the opportunity to learn at the IHI, um, I was a craftsman um, working one-to-one -one with patients. Now, I appreciate that I'm one cog in a complex system. And this skill set that we've developed and gradually learned um, in Sheffield and are now sharing, um, ha we have a confidence. We can see that those tools that are out there in Lean, Six Sigma and, and other industries wrapped around with this coaching skill set in a forum, in a big room where staff can meet uh, um, and have autonomy and being able to test. Actually, these skills can be taught. The capability we're starting to build, the skills and knowledge as to how to do this by team coaching with two co-coaches, we believe can be taught and built at scale. I think there's one challenge that isn't on that slide. It's not just about the capability, it's the capacity. And that's a true leadership challenge. It's not just about the skills and knowledge. It's about that little bit of time, that little bit of resource to do those PDSA cycles. So often as, as, a, as a QI leader in a large organization, I hear from staff about firefighting, how it's so challenging to get away from the operational day to day, to have that opportunity to discover how to take the red beads out of the box. And that's only going to come with time as we gain the confidence. So we're starting to get there. We're learning. I think we're still in the early days. And um, if we can scale this and improve patient flow, 
safety will improve, efficiency will improve, and patient experience will improve, but also staff experience will improve. I'm going to stop there. We share this openly. Um, we have a website listed there, and we hold a little conference. It's not a conference like this. It's a conference where it's frontline staff sharing their, their, their work in a different way um, around um, coaching skills and improvement. Um, it's in one little organization in Sheffield, and um, we're hugely privileged this year. Richard Bomer um, of Harvard Business School and um, uh, recently um, at the King's Fund is, is keynoting with Paul Bertolton's daughter, keynoting on the second day. This is the, and in this uh, conference in, in Sheffield uh, later in the year, some of the improving flow teams, the teams who actually own the work, will be coming and sharing their learning and it'll be real. It'll be them learning their failure as well as their success. Me standing here as a coach, um, I'm very cautious. Um, it's not my work, it's their work. The coach doesn't own the work. The coach coaches the staff who own the work with their patients. This is an opportunity for those staff to share their work, um, the people who truly own it. Thank you very much.